Well, welcome everybody. Um, today's presentation is, um, like Dr. Bramwell mentioned, we're going to investigate uh, practical tips and tricks that may come handy in your hatchery. I'm sure all of you have some tips and tricks that you are using, and hopefully some of these will be new to you and you could use those um, moving forward. So we'll get right into it. The first, the first tip, which uh, I've mentioned in, in a numerous webinars, is to read the manual. Whether you have uh, a James Way a multi-stage or the single stage, or you have Chick Master machines, it's always good to read the manual. Manuals have lots of good information, for example, on proper machine operations, procedures for setting eggs, transferring eggs, procedures for sanitation, and many other useful bits of information, like a section on troubleshooting. So the troubleshooting guides, again, I've mentioned this in, in several other webinars. These troubleshooting guides can be found usually in the back of our um, present, our manuals, and they are useful to help you solve many problems that you might face with your machines. In the event of an issue that you can't find in the manual, you can't find in the troubleshooting section of the guide, please call the JCMI service team and we're here to help. We're here to provide assistance with your equipment and with your hatchery in general. We've got Dr. Keith Bramwell, we've got Chad Daniels, Philip Perry, most of you know, Carolina, Bill Bennett, Hedia, myself, Vanny, are all part of this. And then we can't forget Ronald Rojas, who many of you talk to uh, fairly frequently. So again, if you're having struggles and you can't find the information in the manuals, please feel free to give us a call and we can assist. Again, one of my favorite topics is proper calibrations. You've heard me talk about this a number of times. When calibrating, we want to make sure that you know we're taking we're we're make, we're calibrating our incubators, our hatchers, and we can't forget about our incubator halls, our hatcher halls, and our plenums in the incubator and hatcher halls. We want to make sure that we're doing proper calibrations per the manual for temperature, for humidity, for CO2, and then for room pressures and plenum pressures. When calibrating, if you're making a, a big change um, to your calibration, we want to verify that the calibration is correct before you ever leave that machine. Another thing we want to remember is don't forget to calibrate or recertify your calibration equipment. And this should be done at least yearly. This is one thing that gets most often looked when we talk about calibrations. We forget to calibrate or certify our calibration equipment. So on our single stage machines, if you have a large temperature differential, which you can see here. Now, obviously this isn't a large temperature differential, but if you have a large temperature differential when you do a calibration and you're finding that you're, you're not able to hold the calibrations between calibrations, so every time you calibrate or check calibration, you're having to make changes, this should be a red flag for you. First thing you want to do is you want to verify that you're following the proper procedures for the calibrations, that you're calibrating when you're supposed to. 
The next thing is when you make a change that you are verifying that that change is correct. So follow up and make sure that um, that that calibration is correct before you leave. And if everything is good there, then you may want to think about changing out that temperature sensor before it fails. So, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, talking about a, a, a large differential, uh, a temperature differential right here. And anything over, say, a degree and a half, if you have over a degree and a half differential, you should be, this should start throwing a red flag for you that, hey, you really got to keep an eye on this because typically you're going to be less than one degree for a differential. And the differential is the difference between your calibrations. So you just want to make sure that this differential doesn't get too far out of line because I've seen this happen a number of times now where we have a temperature differential of over five degrees or four degrees. And then all of a sudden we have a temperature probe failure. So just a heads up, just a red flag, give you something to look at. So let's talk about OARs. And I'm not talking about an oar that you use to row a boat or to paddle a canoe or kayak. I'm talking about our outside air references. The outside air reference is very important. And again, one of these things that is often overlooked, especially when we're trying to calibrate our room pressures and plenum pressures. If your outside air reference has a dirt and debris caught in it, spider webs caught in it, or water droplets in it, it can alter that reading, which will then impact your, your room conditions. So if you have room conditions that aren't operating the way they should, you have wild fluctuations within your room or plenum, one good thing is to double check, go outside, check your outside air references to make sure that they're clean, no dirt, debris, spider webs, moisture in those outside air references. If, you, if those are fine, the next thing to check is your reference tubing that is laid throughout the hatchery. You may want to make sure that the, the connections are good, your reference tubing um, isn't pinched, uh, somebody hasn't stepped on it, somebody hasn't pulled it apart, those types of things when they were cleaning on top of incubators or hatches. So again, good thing to um, take a look at. And again, a, a good reminder, because this again is most often overlooked. So let's investigate a little, you know, some tips and tricks that we can find in our multi-stage machines. First one is when entering our multi-stage machines, we always, always want to enter through the exit end because this is much less disruptive to the machine and to the airflow within the machine. So again, first thing is don't go through the entrance end door, except for when you're setting eggs. Other than that, anytime you enter the machine should be through the exit. So for those of you with multi-stage machines, you know there's a lot of items to be checked. And here's, here's just a, a, a few of them and the references in the manual as to where you can find that information. So at the top are entrance and temperatures. For a Super J machine, we're looking at a, at a entrance end temperature or a crossbar as some of you call it of 100.3 degrees or 37.9 degrees Celsius. And this is 24 hours after transfer. This is critical. We can't, we can't get 
you're not you can't expect to get this number if you're not there at 24 hours after transfer. So the problem lies is what if you can't get to this machine and get the crossbar reading 24 hours after transfer? Well, we have a handy dandy little chart here that, that we can utilize. Now this chart is based on a Super J machine. Again, our entrance end temperature, temperatures 24 hours after transfer with a 98.8 degrees set point. We want 100.3 on the left side and 100.3 on the right side. Again, if we can't get to the machine 24 hours after transfer, but we can get there 12 hours after transfer, we should see something around 100.2 degrees or 30 hours after transfer, 100.4, so on and so forth. So this is a handy little chart. You can still get the data because I've been to a lot of hatcheries and they're not collecting the crossbar temperatures or entrance end temperatures. Uh, every time um, they transfer, they're only doing it say once a week because they just either don't have the personnel or the personnel's busy doing other things. So they're missing out on some data and here's a way to get that data. Now, obviously, if you're, you're collecting this data, you're gonna have to note when the temperature was taken and whether or not you're at the expected temperature or not. So let's move to our exit end temperatures. For a Super J machine, our exit end temperature should be around 98.8, two to four hours before transfer. So I have a handy dandy little chart here as well, just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of the, the temperature spread that you would see at the exit end. So in a Super J machine, again, set point at 98.8, we would expect the clear egg, the clear eggs on the top to be at 98.8, the clear eggs at the bottom to be 98.8, and clear eggs in the middle to be a tenth or two warmer. Again, if, we're, if you're dealing with the big J, you would add two tenths of a degree to this because the big J set point it typically is around 99 degrees. So, but if you're running a, a Super J at a 98.9, you would just add a tenth of a degree to this. So whatever your set point is, you should be getting that at your exit end. The next thing is our internal uh, pressures. For a Super J, um, you've heard myself, you've heard Philip talk about this in, in a variety of different pre presentations or even at your hatchery. With a Super J, our, our total cabinet pressure should be between a 0.5 and a 0.55 inches of water column. And that is with the sixth position level. In a big J, we're looking for a 0.4 to 0.45 inches of water column with all positions turned. If you have a hatchery, a multi-stage hatchery, and you're running um, the SST flats, you would expect to see a 0.6 to a 0.62 for a total cabinet pressure. And in the Super J only, we want and we recommend the fifth and sixth position level. This is the only time we would recommend the fifth position level in the Super J machine if you're running the SST flat. Since we're talking about the SST flat, the other thing to take note of is you want to make sure that you're using the right fan blade for the SST because it is different than the normal fan blade for the Super J. 
damper positions. Again, I don't think very many people are looking at this. This is a very good thing to take a look at. When you set eggs, that damper should be in the closed position. The damper should start opening an hour, hour and a half after you set. And four to six hours after the eggs are set, we should be back into the normal operating range of an inch and a quarter to inch and three quarters, or if you uh, split that in half, about an inch and a half damper opening. And then you can see what happens after transfer. That damper is gonna close down a bit. And then about a half hour after transfer, we should be back up to that normal operating range. So let's talk about this a little bit more. And typically, like I mentioned, in the multi-stage machine, this is a picture of the exit end damper. Um, a good thing to do is get a, put some marks with a ruler on the ceiling to designate different, um, different incremental openings. And that'll make it very easy for someone to go in and visualize how far that damper is open. Now, if you see a damper like this, that's you know three inches, three and a half inches open, that should be a red flag, folks. Um, I, ideally, you should not be over two inches for a damper opening in your multi-stage machine. You need to remember the multi-stage machine uh, cools in two different ways. One, and pri primarily, um, through air cooling. So you have about 60% air cooling and 40% from cooling from humidity spray. So if you see a damper opening that is much larger than two inches, there's a few things that we need to take a look at. First thing is, you know, what are, you know, we need to check our calibrations in our machines for temperature and humidity and make sure they're accurate. We need to look at our temperature and humidity in the hallway that's influencing what's going on in this, uh, in this machine. The other thing you wanna take a look at is if your humidity set point for the machine is too low. If it's too low, you have higher humidity in the hallway and you're not getting the amount of cooling spray or humidity spray that we want, the only way that machine can compensate is by running that damper open more. But again, when you start seeing a large damper opening, you're going to start impacting not only cabinet pressure, but you're going to create some hot and cold spots within the machine. So this should be a red flag for, for everyone. We have to talk about rack condition. Um, Many of these hatcheries that I've gone to are, you know, have some age to them, and these racks certainly have some age to them. And we want to make sure the picture on, on the left shows racks that are not square, meaning that um, they should butt up right against each other. And in this picture, they do butt up at the bottom, but at the top, you can see um, there's a gap. The picture on the right, you can see that gap. So are your racks square? If you have racks that are not square and um, you, you're gonna need to replace those. Do you have gaps between the racks as shown on the right? If you do, the problem is, is you're gonna short circuit your ventilation and, um, <clears throat> and create within, you're gonna short circuit the ventilation within the cabinet and create uh, some hot and cold spots within that cabinet. And that's gonna create some issues for you. You're not gonna have a, a good reading for your crossbars nor your exit end temperatures. So a, a, a thing that you can do is lay a piece of plastic over here. And what I recommend is, you know, old curtain material that you take out of your machines. You could cut those into 
you know, six, eight inch um, slices and lay them over the top. And that will help, um, you know, some of that short circuiting of the air within the cabin. Ideally, the proper fix is to get racks that are square and you don't have these gaps. How are your airlines? Are they, are they good? Are they pinched? Are they cracked? Are they leaking? If they are, they should, they need to be replaced. Are your fittings in good repair? What about the condition of the bearings and bushings on these racks? I've been to many a hatchery that the bearings are like totally shot, they're gone, the bushings are all um, worn out. I mean, they're like three, four times the size that they should be just because of all the friction that's going on. That will hinder um, proper turning and proper turn angle. What's your turn angle? <clears throat> Again, turn angle is critical. Dr. Wineland spoke oh, several months ago on turn angle. And, um, you know, if you remember on what he was talking about, you know, turn angle is critical. It's also critical for airflow uh, within the machine. So we want to make sure we have the right turn angle. A good way to do that is test turn your racks prior to setting them in the machine at 35 PSI. It's low enough that if you have an issue that you'll, you'll notice it, you'll know it, it won't, the rack won't turn properly or won't turn at all and um, you can get it then repaired. Typically in a multi-stage hatchery, the, uh, the operating air pressure for the system, your turning air pressure should be around 60 PSI. Uh, many hatcheries that I go to, it's probably twice that. And the reason it's twice that is because our bearings are in poor shape, our racks are in poor shape, we don't have good turn angles and they have to run that pressure up just to even get those racks to turn. So if you're running, you know, 100 plus PSI for your pressures, um, again, that should be an indication that something's probably not quite right. You might have a lot of air leaks, those types of things. This picture, I'm not doing a fist bump with for myself or I'm not fist bumping the, the racks or anything along those lines. This is a good way when I'm walking through a machine, entering through the exit end and going into the entrance end, I can go and quickly check the turning angles on these machines very easily by um, checking the the width between these between these upright uh, columns that support the uh, egg flat tray. That that width should be four inches. Uh, luckily, my fist kind of fits into that four inch thing, and um, so it makes it very easy for me to. I can check every rack and every machine as I'm just walking up that aisle, going in from the exit end, going to the entrance end, and I can do a quick check. You can also use a, you know, a, a digital turn angle uh, device. You can use an app on your phone, such as this one, that you, know, you can open it up and, and get your turn angles. But for me, this is really quick and easy, and I can get a pretty good idea of if we have any issues or not. So let's talk about fan motors and, and spacing. Another thing that um, you know Philip and I find when we're when we're going to hatcheries. In this picture shown, you can see I've got some newer I've got some newer motors, and I've got some older motors here. And on the faceplate of these motors is a um, a little um, label, and it'll have you know how to wire up the motor. But more importantly, it has the expected RPMs of that motor. Typically, what we find is the older motors versus the newer motors, we have a considerable difference in the RPMs. So we do not want to mix fan motors within a machine. You can have all old motors in a machine, 
or all, all new motors in a machine, but you don't wanna have a mixture because you're gonna have um, RPMs that are not gonna be similar to one another. And it's all about having uniform airflow through the cabin. And if we have one or two fans pushing more air, you're not gonna have uniform airflow. Another thing that we recommend is, is periodically checking the RPMs um, at, least, at least twice a year. Uh, even if you did it yearly, it would be okay. And according to the manual, if you take a look, um, plus or minus two and a half percent on the RPMs is acceptable. <clears throat> you get much beyond that. And then you need, don't have to get rid of the motor. You can again, put it into another machine and have like RPM motors in a machine. <clears throat> Here's another little trick that, that we use when we're trying to gauge the spacing the, between uh, the fan blades and, and the housing. All we do is we take a, a little plastic zip tie and depending on the fan blade that you have, we would put a mark on that zip tie and insert it as the fan is going. And once you hear it ticking, that gives you an idea if you're um, within specs or not. It's a good quick check. Um, and obviously check with your, <clears throat> with your company if you're allowed to do this or not. But again, quick check uh, to measure your, your fan spacing. Um, and the fan spacing will be based on blade type. So depending on the blade type you have, uh, you're, you're gonna need a different spacing requirement. And that information is available. If you need that, please let us know. Just like the fan motors, do not mix fan blade types because again, we want uniform airflow within this cabinet and different fan blades will um, create a little bit different airflow. So don't mix fan blades. You can have some older blades in a machine and you could have newer blades in a different machine, but don't mix, don't mix it. So <clears throat> for checking humidity spray, the manual says that you want to check the water pressure at the nozzle. Easiest way to do that is rig up a system like this where you have a water pressure gauge a uh, short little straight piece and a male quick connect fitting that would then insert in here and you'd run the humidity and then you could get the um, water pressure at the nozzle. And that should be according to the manual, 60 PSI. <clears throat> so, through my travels, I see a lot of <clears throat> different ways people are measuring damper opening on the entrance. And a lot of them, people are just, the, the incubator monitors are just opening up the entrance end door, peeking in and gauging that opening. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, we don't wanna do that. So what can we do or how can we uh, come up with an idea so you don't have to um, open that entrance end door or go in through the exit end and uh, go through that aisle, especially if you have a lot of machines. So one way to do that is to um, extend a damper rod as I've shown here above the machine with all thread so you can monitor damper position without opening the doors. Another thing would be to use some sort of a mirror. Again, you could do the same thing with a mirror over the machine. Uh, you can see the damper opening. You'd have marks on the roof of the, of the incubator that gives you an idea of how far that damper is opening. Again, these are uh, fairly easy, fairly quick, fairly cost-effective ways of monitoring your damper openings. So what if you, in a multi-stage machine, PS501 controller, 
what if you're having troubles with your temperature and humidity probes? Um, you're not able to hold calibration, they're fluctuating in temperature, you've changed out your probes. What do we do? <clears throat> well, the first thing is we never, ever, ever want to shorten the temperature and humidity probe sensor wires for your multi-stage or even single-stage machine. Those wires are at a specific length for specific resistance for that probe. So if you alter that length, you are altering that sensor. So if you've altered it, I would get rid of those sensors and put in sensors with an unaltered um, wire length. But okay, <clears throat> so what do you do? You have good sensors, you're still having some issues, you put new sensors in, what, you know, what else can we look at? Well, one of the things we can look at is the fitting where the, this, this cream colored fitting um, that the center wires hook into. A lot of times with machines, especially on hatchers, you have, you know, damp, humid conditions, you get some corrosion built up on, on that, um, on that connector. So my advice is if you change that probe, still having issues, change out this connector. So now let's look at our platinum single stage machines <clears throat> and what tips and tricks we might have for these. So the first tip is to understand the single stage predictability. And what I mean with that is our single stage machines work in a predictable fashion. So for example, in our single stage machines, they should operate within one tenth of a degree of set point. The only time they won't be within a, a tenth of a degree of set point is when the profile is making a set point change. <clears throat> but when it's when we're not making a set point change or the profile's not making a set point change, we should be within a tenth of a degree of set point. If not, this should be an indication that we need to take a look at what's going on with this machine. The CO2 in an empty machine should be around four to 600 parts per million. Now, this is, this is fairly typical, but there are hatcheries that you may have uh, higher readings or maybe even a little bit lower readings, depending upon the room conditions your hatchery or your incubators are in or hatchers are in. So first you need to understand what the CO2 level should be in those rooms so that you'd have an idea of what the CO2 should be in an empty machine. With this one, the CO2 <clears throat> with the damper in the closed position, fully closed position, we should be building a thousand parts per million of CO2 per day. If you're not, you need to take a look at some things. One is your intake and exhaust dampers in the truly fully closed position. If they're open a little bit, that could be one of the reasons why you're not attaining that thousand parts per million per day. Do you have worn door seals, worn um, floor thresholds um, or gaskets on, on the bottom or door sweeps? All those need to be taken a look at if you're not building that proper CO2 per day. Calibration is another one. So again, if you're not building a thousand part per million of CO2 per day, you need to take a look at some things just to make sure that everything's working the way it should. <clears throat> Recovery time should be four to six hours, depending on the machine size. And what I mean from recovery time is the time from when you start the incubation process, when the machine starts at, you know, starts to go to, you know, 100.5, 100.4, whatever your initial set point is, it should take four to six hours to get there. If not, 
we need to take a look at why. Do we have a problem with our electric heat? If you have electric heat, do we have a problem with our hot water heat? If you're running the hot water, um, those are things we need to take a look at. Are your dampers wide open? Anything that will prevent that mach machine from getting up the temperature. One thing to remember, just like the multi-stage in our single stage for cooling, the machine, 70% of the cooling is through water and 30% through air. And maximum cooling should not exceed 70%. Now it's a little over 70%, that's one thing, but if you're running 90, 100% cooling, that should be another indicator that there's an issue. <clears throat> you may have uh, not the proper cooling flow, may not have the proper cooling temperature of the chilled water going through your coils. You may not have the proper pressure. There, there's a whole host of things that could be creating this issue. Uh, again, calibrations could be one of them as well. So, these are some things to keep in mind, and if, you're, and if your machines are not working in this predictable way, we need to investigate. So here's another uh, tip or trick, um, protecting our control panel. A lot of people will, uh, especially on the hatcher side, when sanitation comes in, first thing they do is they, they put some plastic, tape some plastic over the display panel. And the reason they do that is yes, these are, these are watertight, but they are not pressure washer watertight. I mean, if you're running 3000 PSI, 2500 PSI up on this control screen, touch screen, you're gonna get some water leakage over time. You're just gonna, so to prevent, you know, water and electronics from mixing, cause they don't mix very well, we want to make sure that we're protecting our control panels. The next thing we want to do is make sure we're protecting our uh, CO2 and humidity sensors. All our machines come with this little plastic bottle and red cap. The plastic bottle is mounted over here, screws on to cover your humidity sensor. The red cap gets fitted on the bottom of your CO2 sensor. This needs to be done prior to sanitation, prior to washing down. Then we gotta remember to take it off when we set eggs. But if you don't, if you don't get these things covered, you're going to shorten the life expectancy of those sensors dramatically. So let's talk a little bit more about the CO2 sensors and some things that can go, go wrong there. Um, the first thing is on the CO2 sensor, sensor, especially the older version, and some of you with the, the Platinum One machines have the older version CO2 sensor. If you run into a situation where on the touch screen, you're not registering any CO2. I mean, there's nothing, there's no CO2 at all. First thing to do is blow or breathe on the CO2 sensor. As you know, give it CPR, if you will. I wouldn't put my lips against this thing, but just breathe on it, blow on it. And more likely than not, it will come back to life. You'll see um, the, the control display register CO2 and you're good to go. A lot of times with that old sensor, uh, especially after it's, um, you know, you've, you've been using it for years, um, you can get some, um, some issues as far as the signal um, from the, the CO2 sensor to, to the uh, monitor. Uh, there could be some, some issues there, but if you breathe on it, that should take care of it. <clears throat> um, the other thing that we need to talk about, and this correlates or, or goes with the whole calibration thing, a lot, a lot of folks are, are doing a good job of calibrating, but we're forgetting to do the factory reset every time we do the zero or, 
fan calibration on the CO2. Every time you do your calibration, you need to hit the factory reset because, you know, with, with the temperature and humidity on, on our single stage machines, you see an offset that we talked about earlier. Well, there isn't one with the CO2. So we have to get back to factory reset before we start our calibration process. And then one more thing I wanna talk about with your CO2, if you have an issue with your CO2 sensor, mid incubation or mid hatcher cycle, if you had a profile that had a manual damper opening that would correspond to your normal operation instead of CO2 control, you can flip to that particular profile you can switch to, to that profile very easily and continue on and then change out the sensor after you've either pulled hatch or transferred the eggs. So having a, a backup profile with a manual damper opening um, can relieve a lot of stress and a lot of headaches for some managers. So what if your touch screen freezes up? This happens on occasion. What happens, you need to do a, a touch screen calibration. Very easily done. You turn off the main power to the, to the incubator or hatcher and then turn it back on. As it's rebooting, you're gonna see the platinum logo uh, show up uh, in the left-hand corner. And then you're just gonna swipe your finger from the left edge to the right edge of the screen and release it. When you do that, you're gonna get a you're gonna get a target, looks like a target on a white screen. All you need to do is press your finger at the center of that target and release. Four more targets will show up. Press your finger on each of those targets and release, and you're gonna be back in business. If not, follow the troubleshooting guide. There's a there's a section specifically on this. And if you still have issues, feel free to give us a call. <clears throat> so what if you have to rewire um, something in your machine, whether it's a uh, single stage or multi-stage? Uh, one of the things that I think is a great idea is to take a picture of what you're about to take apart so that you know how it's supposed to be put back together when you put it back together. A lot of times when we're dealing with electronics and a lot of wires, taking a picture, marking your wires somehow so that you know where they're supposed to go is very, very helpful. A lot of times people just start pulling things apart and then we have, then we wonder why the machines aren't working and that's because we don't have them wired back properly. So take a picture, is one of the biggest um, tips or tricks that, that I know of. <clears throat> when changing a board, we need to remember to always um, make sure, especially you're changing that SMA 111 board, you need to make sure that we're, we recalibrate the machine, we check our uh, setup functions, our profiles, um, and you can, uh, one way to deal with this is go to another machine and just global everything over to this machine. Or here in a bit, we will talk about another way to um, get that information into the machine. Um, but again, if you change out a board, the main motherboard, whether it's on a Platinum 1, Platinum 2, multi-stage machine, got to make sure we're calibrating and we're checking all our, our functions and setup features. <clears throat> so what if you change out SMA 111 board and you have an ECU fan failure alarm? This happens quite a bit and more times than not, it's where the position of the J6 jumper is. So the J6 jumper needs to be in position one for position one and two 
for our Platinum II machines. And that J6 jumper should be in position three and four for our Platinum I machine. Then you do a fan, re, fan current recalibration. And if that doesn't work, follow the troubleshooting guides or give us a call. So <clears throat> with a fan failure, we've got our, um, our picture of a SMA 111 board. And here is the J6 jumper. So it's uh, towards the middle and towards the top of your SMA 111 board. <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, uh, <clears throat> the SMA 111 board can be used in both the Platinum 1 and Platinum 2 machines. The J6 jumper, what it does is it selects the, the type of fan current sensing that is, is going on. So in a Platinum 1 machine, a P1 machine, the, the current sensor outputs are between like four and 20 milliamps. In a Platinum 2 machine, our current sensing signal comes from our variable speed control and you'll get between zero and 10 volts. So they're totally different. And that's why the jumpers need to be in different places. So here's a picture of a, the original platinum or platinum one with the J6 jumper in the third and the fourth position. In the platinum two, the J6 jumper in the one and two position. And this has to happen or it, you're not gonna function properly. Now, the, the P1 machine, um, if the P1, if your Platinum 1 machine does not use current sensing, which means it has the old sail switches on the fan motors, the jumper in that J6 position, it doesn't matter where it's at. You don't even have to have the jumper in there. My recommendation is still put it in that third and fourth position, because if you have to do the upgrade and go to current sensing, it's then in the correct position. If you throw away that jumper or you have it in a different position, it'll create your issues. So easiest thing is if you have a P1, you should be in three and four and a P2, should be in the one and two position. This will relieve any headaches that may follow. So I talked about um, another way to get information into the SMA 111 board if you didn't want to go through, uh, go to another machine and do a global process of all your setup functions. And this is the backup feature. This is a feature that's great and seldom, seldom used. So with the backup feature, um, what it does is it'll store on your Platinum machines, it'll store your profiles, alarms, um, um, setup functions, and other functions that can be backed up in case you have to change out the microprocessor or the SMA 111 board. If that needs to be replaced, you can easily then um, download everything back into that SMA 111 board. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna, uh, on your touch screen, you're gonna hit the profile button. This screen will pop up down in the um, bottom right-hand corner. You're gonna hit the backup button. And then this screen will pop up. And if you select profiles, what this is going to do, it's, a, it's just going to back up all 20 profiles or however many profiles you have on, on the machine. So if you only have 10, it'll back up just the profiles. If you select alarm setup, it's just going to back up alarm setup alarm delays, alarm ranges, alarm overrun. I would re recommend selecting all. 
And the reason being is if you select all, it backs up all your profiles, all your alarm, um, your alarm setups, alarm delays, ranges, overrides. It also backs up your turning, humidity, fan speed, CO2 setup function. So you would hit all, you would hit the backup, and now it's backed up into the touch screen. If you replace your SMA 111 board, you would then go and hit restore, and it would download all that information from the touch screen into the um, SMA 111 board. Easy, quick, um, and, and pretty neat little pretty neat little feature, save you a heck of a lot of time. Um, so definitely a, a, a good tip trick to keep in mind. Let's talk about our ECU fan. Um, first thing we need to make sure on our ECUs that we have the two center fans rotating in a clockwise position or rotation and the outer fans in the counterclockwise rotation. Even though we have two different rotations, all fans are blowing towards the ceiling. If you have fans blowing into the ECU, that's a red flag. That's not a good thing. Okay, if you have to change a fan motor, we recommend doing a fan current calibration. I mentioned, uh, I mentioned that uh, a little bit earlier. And to do this, you, again, you can find this in the manual, but what you would do is you would turn on the fans, you would go to the main screen, select the alarm setup function, choose fan current calibration, click okay, and let it do its thing. <clears throat> so let's talk about pressure sensors. These pressure sensors are not to be adjusted to increase or decrease your turning rate. These are to monitor, these are to mo these pressure sensors are to monitor if you have a turn alarm. So if you don't have a complete turn, that's what these are for. These aren't meant to be twiddled and adjusted because once you go through the commissioning process, they are, they're changed out and they are adjusted um, so that you properly get a turn alarm. As you can see, there's some letters and numbers written on here. Um, if you have a single zone machine, you would only have two pressure sensors. And um, what, what these numbers correlate to is on your SMA 111 board, there's some LED lights. And um, this indicates this is for the number two LED light, and this is for the number three LED light. So when you're in a turn position, you can see each LED light come on if you've got in each turn position. However, if you have a turn alarm, both of these LED lights should be lit up. So if you have a dual zone machine, so like a, uh, a P80, P120, you'll have four pressure sensors. The ones to the left will be in the back zone and we've got numbers seven and eight. And again, those correlate to those LED lights. So if you have a turn alarm in, in one of your machines, the machine does not tell you where the alarm is, <clears throat> but what you can do is if you open up the cabinet and if you see seven and eight lit up simultaneous or two and three lit up simultaneously, you would then know where that, um, where the turning issue is, whether it's in the back of the machine or in the front of the, of the machine. And typically as Murphy's law plays out, it's always in the back. And it's usually the last rack way in the back. <clears throat> so if you have an issue with say fast turning you're you know throwing eggs out of egg flats we can still maintain the proper turning pressure but we can slow the turn 
with an airflow restrictor. And the part number is attached here. So good thing to have. Most people don't need it, but if you if you do run into a situation where you're you're turning a little too fast and you're throwing eggs out of your egg flats, you can get these restrictors. Very easy to install, and that'll solve that problem. Another good idea to help employees know what airlines should be disconnected first or hooked up last is by putting some colored tape on them. These are the airlines on the left side of the machine in the front and rear zones if you have a dual zone. So it'd be in the front of each of the zones, left-hand side. That's where your incoming air is. So when you're setting eggs, those should be the last lines hooked up. If not, what happens? Well, what happens is if you hook these lines up and these lines are unhooked, depending on whichever line has the air pressure on it, either one of these is going to be flying about, flailing about within the machine, either hitting somebody, which is a safety issue, or causing damage to your temperature sensor, humidity, or CO2 sensors. I've seen this a number of times happening. I, reckon, I highly recommend identifying your incoming air um, tubes so that this doesn't happen. So when you're setting eggs, these are the last airlines you want to hook up. When you're transferring, these would be the first lines you disconnect. Whether you pull this rack or you go to the other side of the machine, still, this is the ones you want to disconnect first. <clears throat> Another aspect is our machine diagnostics, the self-diagnostic. Diagnostics, um, the diagnostics function is a self-contained program that checks all your circuit inputs and outputs for proper function. And it can help detect if you have a problem with such as a faulty circuit board or some other issues within the machine. And typically you would do this if your machine is having some odd behavior or erratic behavior. Procedure for this is very easy. In our Platinum 1 and Platinum 2 machines, you would turn off your fans, press the diagnostic button, and then press start. <clears throat> You're going to get a, um, an analog NAVRAM and diagnostic codes. They should all read zero. In our platinum, in our 24 volt DC machines, 24 volt machines, you can just hit the diagnostic buttons. You do not have to turn the fans off. <clears throat> so ideally, this is what you're going to see. You want to see all good check marks and all, all your codes being a zero. If not, in our manual, we do have diagnostic codes. By, by all means, they're not all of them. So if you run into a diagnostic code that's not on this list, please give us a call and we can help you. Few more, few more slides here. How do we test a solenoid? Quick, easy trick. We've got our solenoid on the left-hand side. When the solenoid is energized, uh, you've got a valve that opens up. You've got electric current going through there. The tip of this solenoid is going to be um, magnetized. Quick trick is to run a little screwdriver, paper clip, something along those lines, and you can feel the magnetism on that screwdriver or whatever you use. Another quick, cool idea, I found this fairly recently. It's, um, it's an app, it's called uh, a magnetic tool. You take, this is a picture from my phone, you, you open up the app, you bring it over close to the solenoid, it senses magnetism, and this thing starts to spin around. So you know if your solenoid is working or not. It's a quick, easy way to check. 
What about how to test a fuse? How do you know if, you, if a fuse is good or if it's not good? Well, an easy way to do this is just take a voltmeter, set it to continuity, and if the, the fuse is good, we have continuity or we have flow through the fuse and your multimeter will beep. If you have a fuse that's bad or it's been blown, you won't get a beep because you don't have a good complete circuit. There's a lot of apps out there. This is just a few of them that I have on my phone. There's many others um, and uh, very useful. You've got different uh, angle, uh, angle apps to measure turn angle, uh, flashlight for candling, the magnetic tool that I just talked about. Here's one to measure RPMs on fans. There's, there's, I'm sure there's a ton of others that you may have, but here's just a few, just to give you some ideas. There's, there's apps out there that will help. Data loggers are great, great tools to help um, make sure or verify that proper egg handling practices are taking place. They help verify internal incubator conditions, hatcher conditions, chick holding condition, chick and egg transport conditions. Great tools to have. When I was running a hatchery, I, I, never, I never not had data loggers. I always had data loggers. We have temperature data loggers, humidity, and shock loggers available. There's other loggers out there. And um, if you're interested, let us know and we can get you some, some pricing or hooked up with, with those. So <clears throat> improving performance in a hatchery is a talent that requires a lot of attention to detail. And this, all this attention to the detail will affect embryonic development as well as the performance and efficiency of your machines. So hopefully this information was useful. Um, and if I will then now entertain any questions you may have. Thank you, Henry. Um, that, that was very interesting, very um, packed with good, useful information for pretty much everybody that's, that's uh, working in a hatchery. So appreciate you putting that together. No, you, you see many of these things, so you kind of know what's really happening out in the real world, I think, sometimes. Um, one of the questions is for, from, you, you kind of mentioned this off and on there, but um, what are one of the things that you would commonly see that that is really a pretty simple fix, but you see it more often than you should? I mean, that, that people should address to kind of help with performance? What is the most common thing I see? Yeah, I mean, you know, because it's like we everybody's got problems, not everybody, a lot of people have issues and problems, but there's a few things probably that are like, okay, we see this too often. <laughs> you, you know the first thing's coming out of my mouth. <laughs> I know, I know. And that's calibration. Give it to us again. <laughs> Calibrations. I, I yeah. can't stress it enough that calibrations and doing it properly. And as I mentioned, calibrating or, or certifying your calibration equipment. Is, is critical and, and a lot of times that's what I see. That's probably the number one thing that I see um, in, in all hatcheries, whether it's single stage, multi-stage. In multi-stage hatcheries, one of the things, another big item is, is condition of your racks. Uh, I go to a lot of hatcheries in rack condition. I mean, they're in, in really, really rough shape. We're not getting proper turn angles. We're not, the, the racks aren't square. So we've got a lot of air leaking up on the top, on the bottom with, as I mentioned earlier, with the gaps between the racks. So that would be big there. Um, and then, you know, just not following, following the manual, following troubleshooting guides, those types of things. But um, yeah, th those would be the, the biggies. Speaking of, speaking of the racks, um, if you got a multi-stage incubator and, and you have a lot of, um, 
racks that aren't square anymore, difficult to turn, any tips? I mean, how, as an ex-hatchery manager, how do you address that? I mean, do you try and repair them as much as you can or just get new ones? Or and how would you go about that? Well, it's going to be some of both. You're, I mean, there's some racks that are essentially unrepairable. The ones that are at a square, um, you know, unless you have a body fender shop in, in your hatchery that you can square these things back up. Um, you know, if you got 1976 vintage racks, um, you know, you might need to say goodbye to those. <laughs> and in the other racks, you, you know, we've got the intern all the internal workings. And, you know, as long as your racks are square, you can rebuild them. But you need to have a good foundation first to, you, you can't build on, a, on, on an unsquare foundation. So yeah, probably some of both. So I would, you know, start a, a monthly, you know, buy a few racks and buy the internal components of a few racks every month to start getting you out of this situation. Yeah. Um, and to kind of just go piece by piece instead of trying to swallow the whole elephant get a little bit here and there. Yeah. And then the other recommendation I would have is when you start having enough racks that are in really good shape, try to segregate them and keep them in a machine that will minimize your issues. You can then start slowly having your racks, all good racks in machines instead of interspersing them amongst you know, a thousand different racks. Yeah. Um, what about um, when we've got uh, a couple of questions about power and electricity, but in the event of power failures, like in summer storms or whatever, how does that affect machine uh, function or maybe calibration for both single and multi-stage equipment? Well, if you, as long as you have generator backup, a, a short down period should not impact um, calibrations at all. Um, you're going to have, you know, a lag of a couple minutes between when the machine goes down and comes back on, but you shouldn't see any, any issues with that. Your temperature will have gone up a little bit. It'll take a, you know, a few minutes for that temperature to once again, stabilize. But as long as, um, you know, you have a, a good, reliable backup source, we shouldn't see any issues. If you do, please email us and, and we can talk about your specific situation. Okay, great. Um, what about our um, the, the CO2 temperature humidity sensors, um, particularly in hatchers that are washed down often? I mean, how often do you recommend people check those or just replace them? Because they are, they are washed down often with a lot of water there. As long as you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, as long as you're taking care of, of the sensor, you, you wipe them down, you get them covered up um, prior to sanitation, you uncover them. We don't have in the incubators, you know, um, airlines flailing about and hitting these sensors. They should last a, a, a good long time. But if we mistreat them, uh, if we take a pressure washer directly to them, they, they don't like direct hits with, with pressure washers either. If we treat them well, they'll last a long time. If not, they'll need to be um, replaced. And you would just kind of follow what I mentioned in the, in the presentation. If you're no longer able to um, maintain calibration, they're drifting, uh, you definitely want to get that uh, taken care of. In hatchers, you want to do your calibrations at least monthly is what the um, recommendation is in the manual and incubators every time you set. Okay, what, one final question um, in regard to our multi-stage and the, the dampers. I mean, what's the best way to square them and what would be, how does, you know, rust, calcium builds up, how does that really affect how they slide and then what would be the best way to repair that and, and check them? Well, um, with a lot of rust, calcium buildup, we want to try to get that off. So um, taking a, a brush to it, and, and sometimes if, if they're really been neglected, you may need to take a little bit of a wire brush to it to, to get these, um, uh, get all that buildup off. Up, up on top of the machine, there's a, a track. You could put a little bit of lubricant, a little bit of a grease material on there. 
just to help aid the uh, damper from sliding. But as far as a rust buildup, uh, calcium buildup, feather buildup, those will all, uh, I guess, impact your cabinet pressures by making that a damper opening even a little bit smaller, even you know, an eighth of an inch, a fraction of an inch will impact your, um, your cabinet pressures. So again, up on top, if you're not square, we try to, we need to try to get everything squared, a little lubrication up there um, and cleaning the tracking off is, would probably be very helpful. Okay, I said that was the last question. I have one more. <laughs> okay, <that's fine. laughs> um, as far as with the with the labor changing and stuff, and and people in and out, a lot of times new people in hatcheries and stuff. Um, how would we go about password protecting some of our controllers? Because it, you know, if you've got a lot of new people there, people might want to be helpful and and get involved with something in a bad way. But how would we go about password protecting everything? Um, Fairly easy process, whether you have uh, Hatchcom 3, Hatchcom 4 can easily be done on, on those machines. Um, and you would just go into the preference section. And if, if you need step-by-step -step process, it's again in the manual. If you have some issues, you can give me a call, text me, email me, and I can certainly walk you through that, through that process. It doesn't take but a couple minutes very easy but i think that's a great idea password protection especially with you know high turnover rates is is really a good idea and limiting you know who has access to full control of the machine is critical yeah okay we're going to let you end on a high note here can you explain how, how to properly calibrate or CO2 sensors, when to do it and how, and how to do it. Somebody's wanting to know specifically how to do it, but also when's the best time to do it for CO2 sensors. Okay, so for CO2 sensors, um, the, the zero calibration, you would go, um, <clears throat> you can do that before you ever put eggs in there. As I mentioned, um, you need a, a CO2 um, gas reader. You would set that in the incubator You'd go to the screen that I showed you. You would hit the reset button. And then you would go to, uh, it, you'll see a, um, depending if you're using gas or instrument, you would hit, say, we've got the instrument. You, you have your reading on your instrument. Whatever that read, say it said 500 parts per million of CO2 in an empty machine you would um, go to the instrument button, hit that, type in 500 parts per million and click OK, and you've done the zero cal. For the span cal, we need to have at least 4,000 parts per million of CO2 within that cabinet. So <clears throat> at 1,000 parts per million per day, if our machines are optimating, operating per, um, optimate, operating optimally, <laughs> Um, you're looking at about four or five days, give it to five, six days, somewhere in that area, do the span calibration. Again, go to your CO2 setup, um, hit your span calibration, hit the reset button, and then um, where you do your temperature reading, insert your CO2 um, meter, the, the hose for the CO2 meter, Whatever reading you have, say it's 4,500, you would then do the same thing. Hit the instrument button, type in 4,500 parts per million, and you're done. Perfect. So it, it's quite easy. I can send you, um, you know, I can send that to whoever needs that. But again, it, it's spelled out quite clearly in the yes. manual. But if you need that, please let me know. I can certainly help you. Or if you're having trouble, I can walk you through that. Um, not a problem. It's in the manual. It's in the manual. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you very much, Henry, for uh, this very excellent presentation and everything you covered. I think it was very helpful for a lot of people. Um, thank you all for, for joining us today and, and participating in the question and answer. Again, you will get a copy, a link, uh, an email with a link to this. You can watch it and share with other people at a later time. Check out our other webinars on uh, 
the James Way homepage has a list of all of our webinars, a lot of great topics that we've covered over the last several years. So um, use those as a reference anytime. So again, thank you for being with us again. And thank you, Henry, for um, your uh, work with us today. And, and Keith Bramwell and, and James Way Chickmaster Incubator Company, thank you for joining us.